Good morning, everyone. This is Dan, and this is the NAPCAN Academy, and I welcome you to another session. Today is going to be our final review of the Vivid Forest. By no stretch are we done with the forest, but this is our last chance to run through it in great detail. The simple idea I want to share with you this morning is this. A quick run through the forest can help us turn a boring idea really vivid. And as you know, the forest that we're talking about is not a forest that looks like this, although this would be a lovely place to spend a little bit of time to be able to reflect on our ideas. The forest that we're going to be talking about, of course, the vivid forest, the idea that if we start in a busy and complex world, there is this tool we can go and walk through spending some time with the six different trees surrounding the central tree and come out with a better idea on the other side. We know that the specifics of the forest break down to these seven essential items. The first one, of course, at the center, the big tree in the middle of the forest, is that any really vivid idea is both visual and verbal, which means that our idea is going to have form. Our idea can be expressed with only the essentials. Our idea is recognizable. Our idea is one that can evolve. Our idea is one that spans differences. And our idea is one that is targeted. Those are the steps that make up the vivid forest. If we start out with an idea that looks like this, nobody wants to touch it. And yet it may have tremendous potential. The whole point about going through the vivid forest is that we can turn our idea from this into this. And as we know, exactly the same thing, 100% pure carbon. One just hasn't, simply hasn't been through the process yet. So the forest gives us the process that helps us turn this into that. How is this going to happen? Well, as we all know, what we're simply doing when we go through the forest is a, simp a series of steps that help us make sure that whatever our idea is, whatever it may be, we have a very specific and methodological way to use both our verbal mind and our visual mind working together to make sure that that idea becomes one that is unforgettable. And I want to spend the time with you this morning going through three examples. And I thought the best way to do it is just to start with an example that's very sort of down to earth. Imagine a kind of a seed very, very down-to-earth kind of example that sprouts into a little plant. That'll be example number one. Example number two is going to be very much kind of up in the ether, very ethereal idea, not down-to-earth at all, something that takes us on a kind of a tour through the cosmos. And then the third idea will be something that sits right between them, so an opportunity for us to meet one more time our little fox character who's jumping and... Uh, our little hummingbird character who's flying up here in the sky. So three examples, one down here, a second one up here, and then a third example to bring them both together. Example number one, very, very down to earth. Some people might even say a little bit mundane. Why? Well, here's what the example is. I've recently been working on a project with the United States Department of the Treasury in association with the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, in association with the American Accounting Association. And for some of you on a previous lesson, you might remember that we talked a little bit about a need for these organizations to promote the educational aspects of what accounting is. And so the fundamental question of our project is, how might we make accounting a more interesting subject to students at all levels, but in particular students at their first encounter, their first class with accounting, whether it's in high school or whether it's in college, to make accounting more interesting and have more of the students decide to stay. So we went out and we did a study, and we asked a whole range of accountants, uh, people in all aspects of the industry, to list a series of words or phrases that we think the general public uses to describe what accountants do. And here are the words that came in. First of all, there were the words that nobody likes. So out of all the people we had voting, boring was at the top with nine points. Narrow came in next. Bean counters, tedious, 
no people, a fearful profession based on rules, debits and credits. Accountants are like police dogs, manipulative, evil, number crunchers. <laughs> well, it's pretty see easy to see that if these are the words that people associate with, associate with accounting, it's unlikely that anybody wants to make that their profession. Then on the other hand, we came up with a series of words that everybody likes. Influential, decision useful. Accounting is strategic. It's about good communications. It's about wealth creation. It's about measurement and trust and judgment and problem solving and truth. And accountants are advisors and are crucial. And these are words that everybody likes who wouldn't want to be involved in a career that associates to those terms. So the way we put this together is we realized that based on these two word lists, there are two essential ways that people think about accounting. And one way is what we're going to call kind of the beans model. Everything's about bean counting, and accounting equals just counting one, two, three, four, five, put things in the right colored basket, end of story. And then the second model is more sort of the atlas model. Accounting is something that really supports society and the economy. The beans model is really the traditional sort of green eye shade bean counter model, where the accountant is a person who sits there with a box of black and white and counts all the beans and puts the white beans in the white box and the black beans in the black box. Pretty exciting. It's right, it's wrong, it's black and white. The Atlas model sees a completely different view where really here's the global economy and the accountant is the person who is happily standing underneath that, supporting it and saying, you know, I'm an accountant and I can support society, and wealth. In the Beans model, the public perceives accounting as a very mechanical, black or white, right or wrong process, where a bunch of data and rules come into this sort of hopper. And here's the accountant over here, madly churning around on this as this stuff comes down and goes into black and white decisions about right and wrong and yeses and nos, which eventually trickle down into assets and liabilities and eventually become financial statements and the balance sheet. That's sort of the traditional model. Very beans oriented, not a lot of fun, not particularly influential. But in the Atlas model, we turn that around and we say rather than a sort of a top-down counting process, in the Atlas model, accounting is seen as the profession that enables informed decision making, really increasing social prosperity. So from economic activity, and all the various shades of gray, what an accountant is really required to do is have the ability to think critically in order to record and report on all those various shades of gray to develop useful information to enable people throughout business to make good user decisions. So we've got these two different models. The critical goal of the first course is to shift that perception towards reality. If we could present accounting this way rather than this way, it's not only more real, it's infinitely more interesting. And when we've done this, we could then show how accounting really is the language of business. Because if we think about what goes on in business, we have capital markets, we have business, we have regulators in the form of the government, we have consumers, we have investors, we have Wall Street. And what accounting really does is it's not another ball out there. Accounting really is the language that pulls all of those together. Makes it sound pretty interesting. If it's the language, then what we're going to be studying in our class of accounting is the grammar of that language. So everything from accounting entries to how to handle accounts to the balance sheet to assets and liabilities, et cetera. So rather than these being the entire course, these just become the grammar of this entire language that we're going to learn. And with this model in hand, we might look at how it could apply in the classroom. Using this model, it's possible to say that as we begin to teach accounting, accountants need to understand economic activity, the issues at the bottom of this stack. And then accountants need to understand how to think critically and what might that mean. And then, as we pull it all together, every one of these red outlined areas becomes one part of what an accountant needs to learn, so it really is the language of business. A much more interesting way of approaching teaching accounting than the mechanistic black and white bean counting. So, quick, how did we use forest in coming up with this model? Form, so 
So we said, well, there's two models, the funnel that goes down and the much more interesting funnel that goes up. Only essentials. Well, you saw it. We had lots of words and we had lots of pictures. Recognizable. We said one model is the kind of the beans model, and one model is the atlas model. Made it recognizable. It's evolving. The entire bottom-up framework, with all of its steps, is one that can continue to be uh, modified as we perfect it. Spans differences. Well, because this model enables both the details of the numeric side of accounting, which are important in the form of the grammar, and it enables the bigger picture vision, which is also critical. And the model is targeted because the model works as an introductory level to newbies, and with all of the text that was applied in description, it then becomes something of interest to professors as well, to real experts. That was example number one. Now let's look at example number two, way up here in the ether. So Euclid, back in 300 BC, was amazing because he said, rather than just looking at the cosmos as this sort of formless stew, said, you know what we can do? We can actually give form to the universe through trigonometry, the idea of planes and triangles and Euclidean geometry, that there is a shape to the universe. And then Rene Descartes came along in the year 1600, and he said, well, that's true. And not only is it possible to be able to put ge uh, geometric form around the universe, but it is absolutely possible to measure that form and plot things out on a Cartesian axis and understand where parts of the universe are located. And then Newton came along in 1700 and said, well, not only do we have this sort of underlying Cartesian structure? But what we can then do is we can apply forces within that and be able to understand how motion works and how bodies move throughout that by a series of rules. And these three guys then, with a pretty good sense of the universe is structured, we can measure it, we can understand how forces work within the universe, and we know what our place is within the universe. But the model continues. And this other guy comes along in the 1920s, Albert Einstein, and says, I love your models, and if we're going to continue to work on the model, I see something interesting, that it's actually relative, because the universe may be structured, but that structure can shift. That structure can bend if we add in another element, which is the element of time. And now we have an incredibly vivid model of how the structure of the universe actually works. And how did they use forest to be able to explain this model? Form, well, the universe has shape. That's great. Only the essentials. How did they explain this model? Well, sure, there's lots and lots of narrative. But in every case, it is a model that is a representation of a picture with labels, labeled charts. It's recognizable. They built this model by using planets and stars and balls and things that we can see and evolving because obviously each model builds off the previous one spans differences because when these gentlemen discuss their ideas they both talk about the mathematics the formulas but all of them equally have stories almost like poetry and of course targeted because in all cases charts with labels and with poetry appeal both to the numeric side of us and to the emotional side of us. And that's why these models of the form of the universe are so vivid. And one last quick example, the model that sits in between the two. I'd like to share with you a little bit of thinking of how I applied the vivid tools as I was writing the book about the vivid tools. And I don't say how did I use the forest, because although I did most of the writing, there was a big team, and then there's all of you that are the people that are reading and feeding back. How did we use the forest? Form. What is the essential form of the idea in blah, blah, blah? Well, there's a mnemonic, and it says vivid. We want our ideas to be more vivid. The form of that says we want to be visual, and we want to be verbal, and we want to use those two models interdependently. This is the form, the essential form of the entire book. Only the essentials. Everything that I tried to put into the book, I introduced both through the verbal and through the visual. 
simple words, simple pictures. Every idea introduced with the most essential part first. How did I use R for recognizable? Well, as I was thinking through how are we going to make words and the way we think about words and pictures and the way we think about pictures more viscerally recognizable, well, I said, okay, let's introduce the fox as our grammarian, our word guy, and let's use the hummingbird as our pictorial gal. That's what I mean by recognizable, taking an abstract concept and bringing it into the realm of that which can be seen. And how did I use evolving? I said, well, we start in a certain point where we have certain approaches that we take towards thinking through our ideas. And what we want to do is add on a series of tools and evolve our thinking to take us to a place where we're a little bit better. So each tool gets added as we go, evolving our thinking. Spans differences. How did this apply? Every time I could, I would apply both the picture, so here's a picture of a ball bouncing down a beach, bouncing higher and higher and finally splashing in the water, and I would use the verbal version of exactly the same thing, where we could say, the beach ball rolls down the sand, picking up speed as it bounces over tufts of grass, getting higher and higher with each bounce until finally it leaves the sand altogether and splash by literally putting the words and the pictures. And lastly, how did I strive to make blah, blah, blah targeted? Well, I tried to make it a book that would be interesting to someone who likes to read and really likes to think in a verbal fashion, and also to someone who likes to look at pictures and likes to think in a verbal fashion. So I actually set two targets for blah, 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 with the hope that by being vivid, we could bring both of them together. We've come quite a ways. We started out in a noisy and unclear world, and the first tool was our blablometer. Helped us clarify the words. Then we used vivid thinking and vivid grammar to help us move from words into pictures. And now we've spent the last of our time the vivid forest. Now let's go straight on to student work. Lots of work to share. Deborah, I want to start with you. Can you hear me OK? Hi, Dan. I can hear you. Excellent, Deborah. Well, you did some magnificent work, and you can tell us uh, with whatever narration you want what you what you want to show. Okay. Um, so this is a little presentation that I put together for a couple of teams that I'm working with, and they're both um, HR teams uh, working on software implementation. And there's a lot of process work that needs to be done uh, for these teams, but they don't have any um, background in process. So I gave them this little um, presentation about process, and I started off with this image because they felt that um, process was maybe a little foreign to them, a little mysterious, a little, you know, sort of overwhelming. So I thought this was a good little picture that, you know, it's, it's everywhere, it's as normal as breathing, and, you know, gave them this little diagram to sort of put that home. Just to bring the idea together that everything is a process, right? Everything is a process, that's Very right. Very good, okay. And then I gave them just a, a brief overview of sort of like the, the, the top two lines of thinking around process, Six Sigma being the first one, which is a set of tools and, you know, where it was developed. And sort of think of it as ivory soap because uh, Six Sigma processes has almost no defects, you know, basically 99.999% defect-free. I think gave them a little chart comparing, you know, how many million, of op a million opportunities and 3.4 defects. Pretty fantastic. Nice representation of the power of process. Yeah. <laughs> and then the next slide is uh, just a little um, bit about lean. Um, so lean focuses on eliminating waste and the, the seven areas that you see there. So transportation, inventory, motion, weighting, defects, overproduction, and overprocessing. And again, it still has that same 3.4 defects per million opportunities. So just a little overview, because th those are sort of buzzwords in the industry. Those this are. is the best fast description I've ever heard of Six Sigma and Lean. And believe me, I've spoken to a lot of people who are involved in them, and they will take hours to explain. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so then I put in a little plug for continuous process improvement. Um, you know, basically that's at the heart of either Six Sigma or Lean Sigma. Um, so it's basically, you know, there's sort of three steps. Document what you do, do what you document, and then continuously improve it. So it's a cycle. 
And then I gave them an example of sort of how you would apply uh, Lean Sigma uh, continuous process improvement. And I came up with this little example from my own life of um, my husband hates to have the dirty dishes in the sink. So he will take them out of the sink and wash them at, or rinse them off and stack them very neatly beside the sink. And somebody has to kind of later put them in the dishwasher. Oh, so they're not uh, actually washed at this point. They're just stacked. No, they're, they're just stacked there. <laughs> <laughs> so that is that is sort of the epitome of wasted motion. Um, so in a in a lean sigma uh, continuous process improvement cycle, you would eliminate that step because it's wasted motion. And then at the bottom, I gave them an example of if you saved five minutes a day, how much that would translate into um, time and uh, money if you you know uh, considered a, maybe a forty dollar an hour total compensation. $2,400 saved per year, is that right? That's right. Excellent. And then um, I gave them a little bit of information about sort of how uh, process documentation uh, works. And I sort of, uh, lemon bars are my favorite dessert, so I, I uh, that came to mind because it has three layers and process documentation typically has three layers. Um, the process flows are at the top. Um, and they're you know very intentionally light uh, you know pictures and and, and boxes, and um, and I drew them you know sort of a very simple um, diagram uh, with just action and decision boxes in it, um, beginning and end, because that's really all they need. I mean, if you go into Visio and do something like that, you'll see you know millions of little icons, and it gets to be overwhelming. But they don't really need to use those, so I just gave them you know sort of you know. This is what it you know could look like you know it's just an action and a decision and you know it's not anything to be overwhelmed by, and then the middle layer is a work instructions or you know typically a step by step sort of narrative approach, and then the the bottom layer is a the dense job aids and has lots of details um, particularly in manufacturing or production. Fantastic process documentation is a lemon bar. <laughs> I don't think it gets much better than this. Let's continue. Again, you know, they sort of feel like this is sort of overwhelming and very foreign to them. So I, I gave them an analogy that it's sort of like a buffet, and they can pick and choose because there's no really right or wrong way to do this. You just sort of pick what you need. So we've got a buffet, and we've got a lemon bar. So where on the where on the buffet is sitting my lemon bar? It's all over the place, isn't it? It's all over the place. That's it's right. It's a buffet full of lemon bars. That's right. And okay, so we've got a big one at the end here. And, and these are just some things that I told them that they should consider as they begin to write their documentation, sort of what format it's in, you know, is it a flow, is it a work instruction or a job aid, where they need to be kept, uh, could be web pages or could be something printed or some videos, um, who needs to access it, is it a few people, is it many people, and how often, is it seldom or often, um, who's responsible for keeping it up, how often would it be updated or reviewed? How would the changes be reviewed and approved? And is version control needed? So all of those things sort of factor into you know how you build your process documentation. Deborah, I have to thank you. This is without a doubt, hands down, the best presentation on process flow, Six Sigma, and Lean that I have ever seen. Thank it's, you. It's really, really, really good. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if, and, and you had mentioned that this is part of a project. Is this material that you have presented to people? Yes, I presented it to two teams that I'm working on. They're, um, they're two different teams that are working on two software implementation modules. They're connected and that they're both HR projects, but they're separate modules. And how has been the response? They loved it. Yeah. Well, and you know, not to be coy about it, but is that a surprise? <laughs> Yeah, you know, actually, it was a little bit of a surprise because I I thought that you know I I know that they're um, they're not familiar with this. They're not process people. They don't come from manufacturing or production background. They're uh, work in higher ed. They work in HR. So they're people people, and and they really got it. I mean, you know, they really sort of like got their arms around it. Went, oh, this is doable. This is not overwhelming. It's not a big you know thing that you need a degree to do. You know, it's something that anybody could do. Even people, people. Even people, Get people. It. Wonderful work, Deborah. Thank you so much. This was really fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate it. And now up, we're going to have, I believe, John is next.
we were going to be using the vivid lens to clarify this, this, this sort of moralistic statement that saving is better than spending. And John, are you with me? Yes, good morning, Dan. Good morning, associates. Go ahead and take it away. What are we, what are we looking at here? Well, we're moving from a, a process discussion looking at people and their emotions. So I took the first uh, personality, the banker, and I tried to see, well, how can I persuade him or her that savings is better than spending? So no offense to bankers and accountants on the line today, but I thought let's use emotions at a very deep level. And uh, if we take the current state of our economy today, we've got some serious problems with banking issues, shall we say, process issues, but also moral issues. And I say, OK, here's a picture of a banker before who is uh, certainly not doing the, the work that he or she should be doing with saving. And they're certainly spending, but perhaps not their money. And so moving from the, the fear emotion, I thought, OK, well, how can we motivate this person for, more, uh, for better behavior? behavior? I said, let's use the emotion of greed. So here we have the banker who is now doing a lot of saving. And uh, you know, the vivid picture is trying to present that. They're yeah. somewhat humorous. Some moment. might say it's a fairly <laughs> accurate representation of what's been going on, wouldn't they? I, I think so. So in the, the second example, I think we can all relate to uh, living and spending beyond our, beyond our means. So here's the consumer, uh, again, somewhat of a, a stereotypical example of a person shopping. But I know that I can certainly relate to that at times. So here's, the, here's our shopper who's using his or her credit or debit cards, and they've got their uh, way of moving around with their shopping cart and their bag. So the emotional state before is certainly that they're enjoying what they're doing. The second illustration is trying to reflect on consequences of, of beyond the moment. And here we have the, uh, the same shopper, and uh, he or she is now pushing the cart, and uh, very much in a different uh, state of mind and uh, state of uh, personal well-being. Uh, the next set of examples, this is the, the economist. And I thought, well, they often say the economist is a dismal scientist. I said the dismal science, excuse me. So we, we take the central concept of money and how do we manage or mismanage it at a, a systems level. And on the left, we have the, shall we say, the extravagant use of, of our economic resources and not very well thought through. And I thought, all right, let's move from this state of extravagance or certainly uh, arrogant disregard for our finances. But I actually was not able to say very much positive about the economic state. So I thought, well, now what they're doing is they're not just conserving resources, but they're reconstructing them in a manner that is uh, somewhat marginally better, but certainly in the long term is not creating economic stability for our future. So all the blame going to the economists on this one. Fabulous. Thank you. Uh, the next. Uh, example 2B, uh, this is a little more uh, whimsical. I thought if I'm talking to a kindergarten or a child or a son or daughter, you say, all right, well, we want to teach you about finance and economy and uh, sort of um, saving. So what's something that a child might want? Uh, and so you know, what comes to mind is you know, animals or puppies and how much is that doggy in the window? And, <laughs> right. <laughs> so we can imagine uh, this. Uh, the image of the, you know, the child pressing his or her nose up against the window pane. I thought, all right, well, even though it's a kindergartner, how can we uh, create visually without any lecturing the concept of uh, savings? And so we have the picture of the piggy bank and some coins going into the, the piggy bank and filling it up. I could have had it overflowing and maybe putting a dollar note in there, but I think the point is made. I the think so too. can learn. The oh, kindergartner like can learn. It looks like this pig has just grown wings, so now pigs can fly. Here too, we go. So. <laughs> Uh, the third example, uh, again, no disrespect to the accountants. This is sort of reflecting back to, to Dan's opening, uh, the encounter and Atlas uh, metaphor. Uh, on the left, we have the traditional accountant who is counting beans and doing a very good job of it. And I thought, all right, how can we move from this condition of just uh, of numbers? And we say, all right, well, we want to move this to something that's valuable. How do you transform these beans? So here's the accountant who's actually creating something of substance that the, uh, the consumer or the economy or uh, another person can use. The other way to look yeah, at it, John, you. is if the accountant does not do a good job, what will we all have for dinner is we'll have nothing more than a can of beans. The, the last example uh, is that of the uh, musician trying to convey this concept, concept of savings better than spending. On the left, we have the musician who is out of work and uh, 
they've used what little resources they have. In fact, their only means of economic support is their musical instrument, and they pawn that instrument and they're looking. And if they can understand the process of saving is better than spending, they can then get that guitar or that musical instrument or whatever it is that they've, uh, their high asset value, and get it back out and put it to practical use. John, I have a suspicion that you enjoy doing this. Indeed so. <laughs> well, I have a thorough enjoyment in, in looking at it, too. This is fantastic work. And again, John, always, always very, very good work. So thanks you so much. Thank you so much. And next up, uh, Barbara. Let's see. Barbara, have you managed to stay on the phone with us all this time? Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you so much. Yes. Barbara, can you take us through your drawings really quickly? Yes. Uh, first one, this is uh, saving for, when spending for a banker. I sort of try to represent a sort of bank counter where bank business is going on. And I just imagined it would be good if the banker um, is doing his business not only on, on credit, but on receipts, on assets. Wonderful. And this is uh, for a consumer. Um, I imagined uh, someone who uh, would consume, uh, sort of consume uh, security. Uh, which is coming from uh, knowing that he has saved some uh, money. Yes, and now uh, this is the economist. Um, there I imagine that um, uh, saving uh, is better than spending is, uh, has to be shown in relationship uh, uh, with grow, growing, uh, with e economic growth and wealth. It's not meant uh, that you, uh, your savings should be uh, stashed uh, in a, in a mattress, but uh, rather it should be invested. And so the function here is over time, yeah. the amount of money that we have if we save will grow. So, the, so it's a question of time as well in this case. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very good drawing. So yes, this is for the kindergartner. Uh, so I imagined some money on, on the bottom. There's a little plant, and there you have a watering can. and. Yes, this one is for the accountant. There I imagine someone who is really counting money, but what he would really uh, would want to like, that the balance is going to, to bend to one side, uh, uh, to the side of a fortune. So it's amazing how many things related to accounting are coming up on this call. Money makes the world go around. And I think we have another one for the musician. Yes, this is for the musician. So there you see a little pot, and there are some coins. And I imagine flipping the coins into the pot that would make a lovely music. Barbara, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I think we've got one more. And uh, Boris? Yes, yes, I'm here. Ah, excellent. OK, so Boris, so if you can do this in a couple of moments. Actually, when I was thinking about this home task, I decided I need a kind of a story which would explain the central concept and then gives. So I found a fable by Aesop, which is called The Ant and the Grasshopper. The grasshopper jumps and sings and plays his fiddle, and uh, the ant is working hard to get the food for winter. Is this the seasons going around here? Yes, yes, exactly. So uh, I created a kind of a chart which is circular, which goes around this. this all. And the black dots uh, mean the wealth of the ant. So the bigger the dog is, the more food has the ant. The, the green line is for the grasshopper. And what we see here that after six months, uh, the level of consumption of the grasshopper drops dramatically. And actually, this is the point where the grasshopper dies. And biologically, <laughs> not a single grasshopper can live more than six months. Uh, so I used this uh, story for the other situations. Uh, upper corner, you see the economist story. And I just decided to give the case of the Eurozone crisis, because it's very uh, similar to the grasshopper and ant fable. Because some, like Germany, for example, uh, behaved like ants. They stored uh, wealth and they were prepared for taxes. And something like Greece, for example, they just consumed everything that they had. And when the crisis happened in 2010, the economy just collapsed. Uh, on the right is the kindergarten story. And I just used the screenshot from Walt Disney. It's the same story, but it, it uh, finishes slightly differently. Uh, because when winter 
uh, happens, the grasshopper comes to the end, and the ants tell the grasshopper, now you can play music for us, and we will feed you. And that's how the grasshopper survive. Save, we don't need just to, uh, to hide food. We, we need to, well, to work. Uh, next story is a story for a banker, uh, which is a parable of talents from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, where two people, two servants, behaved exactly like a, like a grasshopper and an ant. The grasshopper simply dug all the wealth into the ground, trying to save it, and the, and, uh, the other servant invested his money. And what happened? Isolation uh, ruined the wealth of the grasshopper, and uh, the ant happily doubled uh, his wealth. So the idea for the banker is, I think, to be able to save, you need to invest wisely. Uh, then uh, the situation on the right, uh, which is the consumer story, uh, comes from the concept of Alvin Toffler which he described in his uh, book, The Third Wave, written in 1970, where he wrote that to be a good consumer, you need not only to consume, but to produce. And he said that people will become prosumers once. And now, in the time of the Internet, many people have become prosumers. They produce uh, products and they consume products. And uh, I think that the grasshopper who can become a consumer is able not only to consume and die when winter comes, but be able to save something for the hard day and survive. The next story uh, is the story for an accountant, and I use the case of the Andron fraud, a very famous fraud of 2001. And interestingly, this insect uh, uh, on this picture looks like an ant. But in reality, it's a grasshopper. It's a so-called uh, Sudanese grasshopper, which uh, survives by imitating an ant, uh, because it can feed on the ant's food, and it can escape from the grasshopper's enemies. And this is exactly what the Andron did. They tried to pretend that they are ants. And the black uh, chart shows the impression that they tried to produce on their uh, investors. But in reality, they were grasshoppers. They just consumed all their wealth, and their company crashed. And the last situation is the story for the musician. And I uh, used the concept from Richard Florida, a book called The Rise of the Creative Class, written in 2002, which uh, uh, which idea is that ants and grasshoppers can work, work together and they actually need each other. That people who do business, that will produce things, actually need musicians and artists, people who have creative ideas, and so they can get together and invent something new and exceptional. So this is my story. I'm sorry I was too long and probably it's all too complicated, but I really had fun working on all that. And finding all that information. But it's not, uh, not at all. In fact, I, I find your visuals and the, the collection of the visuals to be absolutely fascinating. And the narration you provide to go along with them, along with the humor and the insight, I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I hope that you continue ca to contribute, because this is really, really, really good work. So Boris, thank you so much. Uh, uh, homework for you uh, for the next session will be around summarizing the visual forest. And what I'd like you to do is pick one of these moralistic phrases, either it is better to give than to receive, or the best things in life are free. And as we've seen with the previous homework, I'd like you to illustrate your thoughts about either one, either A or B, and illustrate with at least three letters from the forest. Can you give your idea of form, essentials, recognizable, evolving, uh, span differences or make it targeted. Hey, thank you all for another great lesson. This is Dan signing off from the Napkin Academy, but don't go away. Now on our new platform, you can still submit your homework. Debbie, our community manager, is going to join you right now to show you exactly how to do that. And I really encourage you do your homework. Okay, take it away, Debbie. See you soon. We hope you enjoyed this Napkin Academy classic video. We've made it easier than ever to share your homework. 
After you've completed your homework and have a JPEG or PNG file saved on your computer, come back to this course. Once you're back here, scroll to the bottom of the screen, and in the comments box, you can add a comment. I'm just going to call this one my homework. You can also add images by clicking on the Insert Edit Image button here. In the source box, click on the file. In the Images window, click on Upload, and then click on Add Files. This is going to take you to your computer where you can search for your images. I'm just going to search for mine in pictures, and I'm going to choose this image here. You can also add multiple images here. Click Upload. After the upload is complete, click Close. Then scroll down and you'll see that the last image is here and it's checked. This is the one we just uploaded. Click Insert. I suggest in the dimensions box you change the maximum to 1200 pixels and leave the constrained proportions box checked. You can also add an image description here if you'd like. Click OK. You'll see that your image has been added to your comment. And now the last step the most important one, make sure that you click the green comment button here to upload your homework to the Napkin Academy. We hope to see your homework soon.